But good afternoon to our audience. Um, it is uh, noon on the East Coast of the United States of America. That means it's sea star time. And it's a great day because today we're welcoming uh, Dr. Shalise Sandberg, who will be speaking to us in a minute. Um, before I introduce Dr. Sandberg, I want to alert you to the talk in two weeks' time. Thursday, April 21st, we'll be hosting Dr. Slajana Lukic from Adelphi, Adelphi University, and she'll be discussing the neurobiology of the lexical system, what kind of data is actually missing. Uh, today, however, uh, we're welcoming Dr. Shalise Sandberg, uh, who is uh, also a speech pathologist, and she's an assistant professor of communication sciences and disorders at the Pennsylvania State University where she directs the SAND lab, the Semantics, Aphasia, and Neurodynamics Laboratory. Um, uh, Shalise got her PhD from Boston University, working with uh, Swati Kiran, and her lab aims to find ways to improve the lives of individuals with acquired language disorders with a primary interest in aphasia. Um, she uh, aims to optimize behavioral therapy through the application of cognitive and linguistic theories, uh, to promote neuroplasticity by understanding the cognitive and neural underpinnings of successful therapy, and to alleviate healthcare disparities by improving accessibility to optimized therapy. And all those uh, targets of her research come back in her publications, recent ones on vernacular in aphasia. Uh, she's also just published a tutorial on counseling in aphasia. And uh, much of her work uh, discusses the abstract semantic associative network training. I don't know if she'll be speaking about the latter today, but she will be talking to us um, uh, in her talk toward equitable language therapy in aphasia. Uh, just as a reminder, we'll take questions after the talk. You can start typing your questions in the chat box um, during the talk, and I will moderate those uh, afterwards. Um, with that, I'm giving the floor to Shalise Sandberg. Thank you for coming. All right, thank you so much. Um, okay, so uh, this has already gone over, so I uh, won't uh, belabor the title or who I am or anything like that, but just um, want to say hello. I'm honored to be presenting at CSTAR. I am a huge fan of this lecture series, um, so I feel really great being able to speak to you all. Um, so while uh, much of uh, the population that I'll be talking about today are, is going to be both uh, bilingual individuals with aphasia and non-English speakers of aphasia. So much of my work has been on bilingual individuals with aphasia, but we also do need to be concerned with any individual with aphasia who speaks a language other than English at home, and we're trying to move in that direction. Um, so just to talk about a little bit uh, of background for the need for this kind of work. So more than half of the world's population is bilingual, yet most of the work that we do in aphasia research is English centric. Um, just kind of specific to the United States, um, we know that the population is becoming increasingly bilingual. Um, there's been almost a 200% increase since 1980 and a 13% increase just in the last 12 years. Um, and the, the uh, pop, part of the U.S. population that uh, is bilingual or non-English speaking um, are at risk for aphasia and, and at risk for aphasia um, from stroke is growing. So nearly 43% of foreign-born individuals living in the U.S. are above the age of 45. Um, also, the U.S. Uh, bilingual and non-English speaking population is currently underserved in speech language pathology. So even though we have about 20% of the US population that speaks a language other than English at home, we only see about 9% of, of this uh, population represented on the SLP caseload. Um, so this speaks to a, a disparity that we see in, in addressing the needs of people who are not English speaking. Um, <clears throat> so when we talk about um, serving the needs of people who are living with aphasia, it's important to consider these four overlapping factors. So many of you are probably familiar with the AFROM model from Kagan, um, which basically talks about how, uh, let me use my little pointer here, there we go. So we've got uh, how participation in life situations, personal identity, attitudes, and feelings 
um, communication and language environment and language and related impairments are all going to contribute to living with aphasia. And when we're serving an individual who speaks a language other than English at home, and we fail to address that home language, we risk failure in all of these areas. Um, I just want to give a quick uh, shout out to Yina Kike. She gave a really great lecture about a month ago at Focus Aphasia um, about uh, how we can address the needs of Spanish speakers with aphasia. Um, all right, so as I said before, the uh, aphasia treatment research has historically been very English centric. And so there are really not very many available treatment protocols um, that are specifically targeted toward bilingual individuals with aphasia or just in other languages in general. And um, the, the CATS group or the Collaboration of Aphasia Trialists um, has uh, uh, one of their goals is to support this international research activity to increase the availability of clinical tools for people with aphasia who do not speak English and their healthcare professionals. Um, and I, if you haven't checked out CATS yet, I highly recommend checking them out. Um, this is just one piece of the puzzle and they, they focus on a lot of different uh, great aspects of how we can improve assessment and therapy and basically improve the lives of people with aphasia. Um, some of the factors that we want to consider when we're thinking about uh, uh, therapy for aphasia is uh, we want to be looking at the cultural and linguist linguistic appropriateness of the stimuli that we use in therapy, but we also want to be thinking about the theoretical basis and the efficacy of the therapy. So let's uh, first think about the cultural ling and linguistic appropriateness. And we, we know that it's inappropriate just to translate the therapy materials that we have in English to another language. Um, and there was an article by Seacrest and colleagues in uh, 72 that described five types of equivalents that can really be affected by translation. So first, there may not be a translation equivalent for any given word. Um, next, uh, we can have uh, these idioms in languages that may not make sense, that like totally make sense in the, the, the language that it was developed in um, because of this kind of cultural meaning that it carries. But when you do this direct translation, it's just not going to make sense. Um, we also have grammatical differences that are going to affect uh, or kind of prevent a word by word translation. And while this may seem obvious, think of how it would affect assessment and treatment of specific uh, specific, specific grammatical structures. Um, and so uh, this example here for the, the uh, words on and off, those we wouldn't actually use those uh, in the sentence, get on and off the bus, if we were to translate that into Spanish, they're actually uh, verbs that, that are particular for those ideas. Um, Cultural translation refers to objects and experiences that are present in one culture, but really don't exist in another. So one example is the Spanish Plaza, which is this large outdoor market, um, and it's located in most Latino towns and cities, but these don't really exist in American culture, and so there's really no word for it. So even though we, we've kind of borrowed the word plaza, we don't use it in the same way. Um, and the cultural equivalent might be shopping mall, but this really kind of describes a different experience. Um, finally, conceptual equivalence refers to uh, the notion that words may have several different meanings or senses in one language, but not in another. So a good example of this is the English word love, which is used in several different ways to just express this kind of positive feeling towards something with varying degrees. But in Spanish, there would be different words for different types of love, so you would never amor a cake. Um, all right, so then... One other thing that we need to be thinking about is uh, this idea of cultural salience. Um, and so not just is it, are we you know, translating words, but also thinking about what those words mean to people. So if we take the example church, depending on who you are and how you grew up, even though it's the same word and oops, could be translated, we've got all of these different ideas of what a church is just to, based on your religion. It doesn't even necessarily have to be based on your culture. You could have a very similar culture to somebody, but a different religion and thus a different church, right? Um, so there's just some uh, real nuances to thinking about these uh, things. Now thinking about uh, 
the theoretical basis for therapy and efficacy of therapy, we do want to make sure that our treatment protocols are based on theories of normal and disordered cognition. And we want to make sure that our protocols are evolving with the most current evidence. So I've, uh, this picture that I have up here is, is kind of the easy target of bloodletting. Um, but we, we want uh, to have kind of a reciprocal relationship between theory and practice so that um, we have uh, the results of therapy. Does it actually work? Um, so we've got this efficacy information and uh, can that inform theory, right? And so we've got uh, theory informing practice and then practice also informing theory. And we we want to make sure that we're continually learning and growing and, and applying the most recent evidence. So I'd like to present um, two projects that we're currently working on that uh, aim to help fulfill the need for culturally and linguistically appropriate and evidence-based uh, bilingual or non-English uh, therapy materials. And so um, we've got two projects. One is the Bilingual Naming Therapy website that we've developed, and then also Bilingual Abstract Semantic Associative Network Training, or BABSAM for short. Um, so the first, uh, this website uh, that we have um, provides freely available treatment materials for speech language pathologists in a variety of languages. Um, it's an ongoing project with Teresa Gray at the Gray Matter Lab at San Francisco State and Swathi Karen at the Aphasia Research Lab at Boston University. And it was originally funded by a multicultural activities grant from ASHA, but um, right now it's running on fumes and goodwill. So the overarching goal of this project is really to support speech language pathologists who provide services to ind individuals who do not speak English, um, who are bilingual or just non-English speaking. But uh, they, when these speech pathologists don't have access to evidence-based therapy materials that are culturally and linguistically appropriate for their clients. So the therapy protocol that's available on this website um, is one that Swathi has been using for some time now. Um, it's a semantically based uh, treatment where we uh, focus on the semantic features of words. For those of you who are unfamiliar with this type of therapy, the idea is that when you train the semantic features of a concept, it strengthens connections um, to its lexical form. And then that's going to support the selection of the target among uh, semantic and phonological competitors. And there's some evidence that not only will this therapy work in another language, but also that it can promote generalization both within and across languages if the person is bilingual. So we have a model for the training program, but how do we create appropriate stimuli? We know that direct translation is problematic. Um, and uh, one of the, the examples that we've run into uh, developing this, the, the features for this website is we had this feature waddle for um, duck or other birds that, that have that uh, same type of walk. And uh, what we found out is that in Spanish, there's really no word for waddle. And so it's to walk like a duck, which just isn't going to work if the target is actually duck, right? Um, so we had to, to get rid of that feature for Spanish, but it's just one example of this, uh, this problem with translation. Um, so uh, one of the, the things that we're doing is we're taking these translations and we're making sure that we do a verification of the label for pictures and a verification of the features. And so um, luckily Swathi had a nice database of 678 words and 430 features that we could start from. And um, what we've been doing is we're doing a first pass using Google Translate. And then we take those translations and we have a, a native speaker check all of the translations um, and make sure they're accurate. Then we take those translations and we're putting them up on MTurk, uh, which is a crowdsourcing platform to verify picture labels from native speakers of those languages. Um, so we're, we're doing this for both the picture verification and the feature verification. And this is what one of those surveys looks like. So um, this part is the picture verification. This part is the feature verification. We have uh, 34 to accommodate all of the items. We have 34 surveys, each with 20 items. And each of those items have 24 features. The goal is that we're trying to get 
um, 12 yes and 12 no responses um, for the features. So we, we have a native speaker proofread each of these surveys to make sure that not only the translations were correct, but also the features culturally made sense in the target language. Um, any of the concepts that were not culturally appropriate were removed and any features that were not culturally appropriate were removed or reworded for each language. Um, and then once, uh, so uh, during the survey, the, the person not only verifies, does this picture equal this label that we've given it, but if no, then what's a better word or better label for um, that picture? And then uh, for the feature verification, they just decide um, if, these features should have a yes or no uh, response. And we, uh, when we get this information back from NTURC, we only use features that have more than 60% agreement across uh, the, the raters. So um, this is uh, just to give you an, ex uh, an idea of what the website looks like. So we have a page that talks about the therapy um, and why we developed it. Um, Kind of the background of the therapy itself and, and us as authors. Um, we have some instructions for how to use the website. And then once the person uh, clicks on the therapy tab, they're able to choose a language and select a category of items that they want to work in. Once they select, select a category such as animals, then they've got um, all of these different animals that they can choose from. Um, and then they move on to uh, the, the steps of therapy. And so the first step is going to be naming the picture. Um, so the, the participant will name the item and then the speech therapist types that in. They submit it, it turns green if it's right. Um, it turns red if it, if it doesn't match what we have in the database. Um, but there's an override button so that the speech pathologist can override it if they feel like that's a correct response. Um, then once uh, that is complete, then the features pop up and the person goes through and decides uh, if each feature matches or not. And then we have uh, the, the, uh, their accuracy uh, that pops up according to what we found from our surveys. Um, again, this could be a conversation with a speech pathologist if they feel really straight, strongly think this is a uh, singing, right? That bears sing, right? They might feel really strongly about that. Um, so then once they do these steps for each word, then they'll get to uh, the final step, which is going to be um, naming all of those items again that were just in the, the treatment steps. Um, and then we have a results page where they can see the, the accuracy of their first naming uh, uh, attempt, their second naming attempt, and also their feature selection accuracy. And then we've got um, the breakdown of their performance by the word as well. And then this can be, this isn't saved onto the website. So no, there, there are no logins or anything like that. Um, but this information can be printed out. All right, so we have this cute little website, but how do we know that it works? So yes, it was adapted from a therapy that we knew uh, was efficacious, but we uh, wanted to test it in its website form. Um, and so uh, this is uh, work that was done by uh, Teresa Gray's master's student, um, Hannah Corisani for her master's thesis, um, and also Marie de Morales, who helped out with the Spanish part. Um, and so the two questions uh, that Hannah had were, uh, can this free online tool improve naming in Spanish or English when uh, first therapy is provided by a trained SLP student clinician or when therapy is provided by a trained caregiver? Um, and so the, and she'll be presenting this work at uh, clinical phase, uh, physiology and also the International Aphasia Rehabilitation Conference that's coming up. So, the reason for the second aim, why we're doing this uh, caregiver training. Uh, so the, originally the website was created for SLPs to have access to materials that they needed. Um, but we really, when we started thinking about this, we wanted to take this one step further and try to address the lack of SLPs able to provide therapy in a language other than English, and also the financial barriers that people with aphasia face. Um, so knowing that aphasia is a lifelong disability, and often insurance doesn't cover therapy in the chronic stage. Um, and this doesn't even account for uninsured individuals who are more likely to be those in need of services in another language. And I'll, I'll get more into this in, um, in the discussion. 
So uh, we had four participants. They all had a left middle cerebral artery stroke um, and they were in their chronic stage of recovery. Um, two were monolingual English speakers and so they were trained in English. Um, two uh, were trained in Spanish. One was bilingual Spanish English speaker and one was a monolingual Spanish speaker. Um, the caregiver relationship uh, varied across participants. Um, and so that's, it's nice to know that it kind of uh, doesn't matter who the caregiver is that's trained on this. Um, so uh, the way that we uh, conducted the experiment is that first we had a, a pre-testing phase um, where we did some baselining, we did some um, assessments, uh, language assessments, cognitive assessments, uh, quality of life assessments. And then the first uh, phase of therapy was this clinician-led treatment. Um, and we focused on 20 words over five weeks. Uh, sessions occurred twice a week, and there were weekly confrontation meeting probes. Um, between the, the two treatment phases, we had the caregiver education, where the caregiver read the training protocol. Um, and then they were able to observe that this uh, caregiver education actually started um, towards the end of the clinician-led therapy um, so that they could observe one of the clinician-led sessions. And then they practiced with the clinician before they, they did their own phase of therapy. Um, so with the caregiver-led treatment phase, uh, there were 20 new words, um, same amount of time, five weeks, same frequency, twice per week, um, and also weekly confrontation naming probes. And those were conducted um, by Hannah or Marie. And, uh, and then we had our post-treatment uh, testing phase. Now, the, just so that you know how we, we uh, created the stimuli, so the words were chosen by testing items in the categories, animals, vegetables, small items, and clothing. Items that were missed two thirds of opportunities during the baseline were used as trained items and were split evenly across phases one and two so that both phases had similar items. And then leftover items were used as the control items. So as you can see, this treatment was wildly successful. These effect sizes are huge. Um, and we, we see this not, not only a, a nice uh, jump in the level, but also uh, um, a nice positive slope. Um, and the effect was maintained for everybody, pretty much. Then when we skip over to uh, the items that were trained in the caregiver-led phase, um, we also have a, a jump in level and a nice positive slope, but we did have kind of a rising baseline going on. Um, and so this was, uh, this affected uh, participants one and two especially, um, but they all still had kind of nice slopes. So one um, had this rise in baseline, two had a little bit of a drop at post-treatment, so, so they do have a little bit lower effect sizes. Um, then when we compare this to the control words, uh, there was really not much change in those items. So, um, we feel like we can conclude that this free online um, evidence-based therapy tool can be used to improve naming in Spanish or English, whether the therapy is provided by an SLP or provided by a trained care caregiver. Um, but why do we care so much? Um, hang on, I'm getting a notification. I apologize. All right. Um, so why do we care so much about making the materials free and available for home use? So um, we have a lack of resources for SLPs to purchase materials. Uh, so that's why we designed the, the website in the first place. But we also know that we have a lack of bilingual SLPs who can work with people with aphasia. And we know that there are financial barriers um, for individuals living with aphasia. In, in general, uninsured uh, patients are less likely to seek services due to financial bur burden. Aphasia is a lifelong disability. Um, Medicare outpatient services are limited and privately insured patients are more likely to seek SLP services and can usually get them for longer, but eventually the, the insurance runs out. Um, and these financial barriers tend to be more pronounced for non-English speaking individuals in the US. We know that undocumented immigrants are ineligible for Medicare and 43% of foreign born Latinx people are uninsured compared to 14% of US born Latinx people. 
Um, and here I just want to give a quick shout out to John Pierce at La Trobe University, who um, also has uh, this uh, online aphasia therapy that he's developed that's freely available and that he's um, trying to get in as many languages as possible. <clears throat> All right. I'm going to use ecological validity to kind of segue into our next project. Um, so the bilingual naming therapy website is great for allowing patients to choose which items they would like to work on, which we know has benefits since salience promotes learning and neuroplasticity. Um, so that's great for allowing the patient to define their own stimulus type. Um, we also know that only training concrete items has limited use in conversation since natural conversation tend, tends to have uh, more abstract vocabulary. Um, and it is important to consider conversational factors so that the work we do isn't limited to the single word level. Um, in terms of generalization or uh, this benefit to untrained items, we know that we'll never be able to actually retrain an entire vocabulary. So we do what we can to promote the transfer of benefit from the directly trained items to the untrained items. Um, and this can be done in several ways by leveraging what we know about how language is organized and processed. Um, and while this hasn't been a specific focus for the bilingual naming therapy website, it has been a focus of the work that I would like to describe next. So something that I've been working on since I was a master's student at UT Austin with Swathi Karen, who's now at BU, um, is what we're calling absent um, or abstract semantic associative network training. So this therapeutic technique for word retrieval in aphasia focuses on training the features of abstract words within a particular context category, such as courthouse or hospital. So this is an example for uh, training the word law, where we believe that when we train the semantic features of the word law, we're also going to get benefit um, to both abstract and concrete words that are also in the category courthouse, like judge, guilt, oath, and jury. And like most semantic therapies, absent is based on the notion that activation spreads from one node to another within the semantic network. And the difficulty with lexicalization or the retrieval of a lexical form um, from a concept is due to sub threshold activation and that training semantic features or descriptions of concepts is going to bring them above this needed threshold for lexicalization. Um, so for absent, it's important that we point out the theorized difference between abstract and concrete word lexicalization, which is pictured here. So here we have this uh, increased threshold uh, that's needed for activation. Um, in black here are concrete words. Uh, in the, the striped are the moderately uh, abstract words. And then the dotted lines are the, the completely abstract words. Um, and so this is the NICE model by Newton and Berry, and it's really handy for thinking about how activation spreads differently for abstract and concrete words, where there's less spread for the concrete words. And this equates to a better chance of that concept crossing the lexicalization threshold. Um, we'll swing back around to this idea in a second. Now, with concrete word training, generalization is thought to take place to items that share semantic features. And Karen found that training atypical items boosts the generalization effect because when atypical items are trained, um, then you get uh, the, the training of typical features as well. Um, and so say you're, you're uh, training Robin and you train these kind of typical features, you're really just going to get uh, the items that have those features. But if you train something like ostrich, you're getting um, benefit to everything that has all of the features that an ostrich does, including those characteristic features of an ostrich, um, that it's got a nice long neck and runs like crazy. Um, and this aligns with the complexity account of treatment efficacy, or CATE for short. Now, absent also aligns with the CATE, but the mechanism doesn't appear to be shared features, but rather another way that activation can spread within the semantic system. There's a long history of psycholinguistic and neurolinguistic studies of the dissociation of abstract and concrete word processing. I'm not going to go over all of those now, but I do want to point out one that I'm, I'm quite partial to right now, which is the proposal by Crutch and Warrington that concrete words are organized. Oh, 
oh my, here we go, that concrete words are organized taxonomically and abstract words are organized thematically. So specifically, they suggested that concrete words are strongly linked with items that share semantic features or category coordinates, while abstract words are linked with associated items. And this actually aligns with Newton and Barry's nice model that I mentioned earlier, which posits that concrete words are linked strongly with a few concepts, while abstract words are loosely linked with many concepts. Um, also, there's some great work by Hoffman and Lamb and Ralph regarding the fact that abstract words tend to have more meaning variations um, and have more semantic diversity, uh, and which makes abstract words uh, more complex in, in their network structure, along with these uh, loose connections to a lot of other words. Um, and while this is a relative disadvantage for word retrieval, it appears to be an advantage for generalization. And we have some evidence that when abstract words in a context category like church are trained, concrete words also benefit, but the reverse is not true. And we now have data for approximately 30 individuals who've received at least abstract word training. And of those that have received that abstract word training, approximately half have also received concrete word training with the same paradigm as a control. And we've adapted ABSANT for the use of bilingual populations and now have FABSANT. Um, like I said earlier, we're focused on, uh, we've been focused on bilingual individuals and that's the data that I'll be presenting today. But I do wanna point out that this protocol can be used for monolingual Spanish speakers, or sorry, monolingual non-English speakers. And we've recently recruited a monolingual Spanish speaker to participate in this therapy. Now, of course, we couldn't just translate items we were already using with our monolingual American uh, English speakers. Um, so we do a category generation task with native speakers of each language uh, to create the therapy materials. We ask about um, 15 to 20 native speakers to generate both abstract and concrete words in a variety of categories, including places like school and restaurant and themes like soccer and holidays, and some really culturally specific categories like telenovela in Spanish. Um, these types of thematic categories really promote the generalization, or sorry, the generation of uh, abstract words in addition to concrete words. Um, so just as individuals with aphasia who speak other languages reach out to us, we add that language. And we've been really lucky to have a, a nice diverse set of students um, who are native speakers in a variety of languages. So we've uh, been able to do this. So um, what I'll do is I'll walk you through an example of how we developed the Spanish materials. So this work was done by one of my masters, uh, my former master's students, Christina Rossi. Um, so she uh, recruited 15 native Spanish speakers, age 20 to 73. We wanted to make sure that we were getting a nice age range um, to uh, kind of match the ages that we might see of people with aphasia, make sure we got up there into the older adult population. Um, we recruited people from uh, all sorts of different places uh, that speak Spanish. Um, and then uh, we had a set of categories that we felt would be culturally relevant for Spanish speakers. So we had uh, beach, church, holidays, house or home, um, restaurant, school um, or university, and uh, plaza, uh, telenovela, telenovela, and soccer. So for each category, we gave uh, the respondents two minutes to produce as many words as they can. People tended to produce about 20 words per category. Then after we had them generate words in the category, we would have them rate the category on its cultural relevance. And so one would be not relevant, five being very relevant. Um, across these categories, we had an average of uh, 4.16. The highest rated category uh, with a 4.92 was home. And the, actually the, the lowest rated category was telenovela, which was a total surprise, um, but it wasn't totally irrelevant. It was above uh, the midway mark there. So when we choose the categories for therapy, we want categories where 
both abstract and concrete words were given and that there are plenty of each. Um, we want categories that have high agreement among raters. Um, we wanted categories that had high cultural relevance and categories that had minimal overlap across the categories that we'd be using. Um, so for example, we're using restaurant, school, and soccer as the categories for our Spanish English uh, bilingual participants with aphasia. And the reason that we need three categories is because uh, for this therapy, we're using one category to train one language, another category to train the other language, and then we're holding one category um, as a control category consist consistently across people. Um, this is just a, an idea of the other categories that we've been using for the other languages that uh, we've developed this uh, uh, protocol for. So, um, the, the participants that we've had are 15 bilingual people with aphasia, um, ranging in age from 30 to 82, all sorts of different races and ethnicities, um, and uh, all these different languages um, and different pre-stroke dominances. Um, most of what we've had are the Spanish-English bilinguals. This is uh, an example of, uh, or this just shows what our, our study design looks like. Um, and just to remind you, so for uh, this is an example of, of what we have for our trained categories and our control category for uh, the Spanish English bilinguals. Um, so after baseline, uh, the first phase would be either restaurant or school, and it would be in either English or Spanish. Um, that phase would last about 10 weeks. Um, and then we, uh, uh, at the beginning, we, we were flipping people immediately from phase one to phase two, um, but then we had some people who needed a break in between phases, and then we realized that's a really great idea to give people a break between phases so we could um, put some probes in there. So we have um, some people had zero probes, but a lot of people had uh, up to five probes in this kind of interim uh, phase. And then uh, for phase two, we would uh, do the opposite. So whatever category uh, they weren't trained on is the category we train in whichever language they weren't trained on is uh, the language that we would train. Um, and then we did a, a post-treatment phase where we would have our post-treatment probes again, and then a, a battery of assessments. And then we also had um, a couple of maintenance probes that we would give uh, between one and three months after uh, the post-treatment phase. Um, I'm actually not going to be talking about maintenance effects here. Um, so the reason that we uh, chose to conduct two phases, what uh, one training the dominant language and one training the non-dominant language was to try and examine uh, cross-language generalization. So one pattern that's emerged in the literature is that there seems to be a trend for cross-language generalization from the weaker language to the stronger language. And one of the models that helps us to think about what might be happening is this revised hierarchical model introduced by Kroll and Stewart. And in this model, the idea is that there's a lexicon for each language and a shared semantic system that each lexicon pulls from. And when a person is balanced, the connections among the nodes are approximately the same weight. But when one language is more dominant than the other, so for example, when a Spanish speaker learns English later in life, you might see something like this, where the Spanish lexicon has a strong connection with the semantic system and a weaker connection to the English lexicon, while the English uh, has a weaker connection to the semantic system and a stronger connection to the Spanish. Um, now for uh, uh, a situation like this, um, uh, sorry, I, I, I lost my place here. So, so the idea is that the non-dominant language is piggybacking on the dominant language to get to the semantic system until its connections with the semantic system are just as strong. Now applied to therapy, we can imagine that in this example, when the dominant language Spanish is trained, then uh, English won't really be influenced due to that weak connection um, from Spanish to English. However, when the non-dominant language English is trained, because it piggybacks on Spanish to get to the semantic system, Spanish is also activated and therefore benefits. So in our study, um, we were looking uh, not only at this cross-language generalization, but also within language generalization. Um, 
as I spoke about, training abstract words does tend to generalize two concrete words in the same category. So um, in our study, say that we're training a Spanish-English bilingual person with aphasia in the category restaurant. Now, we would expect that training abstract words in the dominant language is going to promote within language transfer to the concrete words in that category in that language. But when uh, abstract words in the non-dominant language are trained, we expect both within and cross language transfer to occur. Um, all right, so uh, I'm just gonna quickly go through the treatment protocol. Um, the probes that we use to uh, measure treatment effectiveness were category generation probes. Um, so we would uh, give the person two minutes to list as many words as they could think of within each category. Um, we did this uh, once a week or basically every two sessions. Um, and we would make sure that they knew what abstract words were. So uh, we gave them example ideas and feelings and what concrete words were. Um, we also gave them an example. Of course, it wasn't an example of any of the categories that they were working on. Um, and uh, for because we were working with bilingual participants, we had them do this category generation, um, not only in all three categories that we were tracking, but in both languages at every probe. And we would counterbalance, we would we randomize the categories and we would counterbalance uh, which language came first for each of the probes. Um, and uh, between languages, we would uh, have them converse in that language for about five minutes to kind of get them in set. Uh, this is showing our, our very first uh, treatment session, which we call a brainstorm session. This is where we would uh, um, develop semantic features that are personally relevant for each person. And so uh, during this first session, we would go through all of the target abstract words that they'd be working on, and we ask them these sorts of questions um, to try and get some of those personalized features. The, this is uh, the category sorting step that we would do at the beginning of each therapy session. So uh, for the control category and uh, the, the trained category, they would just um, have, look at all the abstract and concrete words. There were uh, 10 abstract words and 10 concrete words that we chose as targets um, for each category. And we would have them sort all of those words into their um, respective categories during each session. Um, then we would do this feature selection step. So these features included uh, the personally uh, relevant features that they came up with, plus some sort of generic features like is generally considered positive, is generally considered negative, exists inside the mind, exists outside the mind. Um, and then also we had some distractor features that they could dis discard right away as not a feature, right? Like lives in water and can fly. Then the next step was feature verification, where we asked them yes, no questions about the features for these words. Um, and we would ask them 15 questions, five that we expected a yes response from, five that we expected um, a no response from, but were a little bit harder to decide because they, they could apply to other words in that same category. And then five that were these distractor features that they could immediately reject. Um, so an example would be for emergency would be um, something like, is it an idea? Yes. Does it have a practical use? I think we can all argue no. Um, and does it have shells? Definitely no. Um, next, we would ask them to verify if the word was abstract or concrete, a synonym for that word, and then have them recall the word that they were working on. And then the very last step of therapy was what we called free generative naming, where they had a uh, kind of unlimited time. We, we would uh, 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 put in the protocol that it should be um, at least five minutes, but no more than 15 minutes um, for them to just say as many words as they could think of in that category that they're training. Um, and so uh, if they were training in the word hospital uh, and also feedback and cues were allowed. So um, this would be an example of the type of feedback you could give. Yes, emergency definitely fits in the category hospital. What else does emergency make you think of? All right, so um, the way that I'm gonna be presenting the results, I've separated it into um, balanced and unbalanced bilinguals. Um, this is based on the pattern that's been observed that balanced bilinguals tend to show cross-language generalization regardless of the trained language, um, while unbalanced bilinguals tend to show cross-language generalization when they're trained in the non-dominant language. So um, I'm first going to show the unbalanced group. 
So when um, unbalanced bilingual individuals are trained in their non-dominant language, we see that the directly trained abstract words are passing the small threshold. Um, so we're using the, the small, medium, and large thresholds that were uh, um, given by Beeson and Roby in 2008. Um, we're using the direct training uh, thresholds for direct trained items and the generalization thresholds for uh, items, uh, general, items that are generalized to. So when we start looking at generalization, we, see, we also see within language generalization, two concrete words in the same uh, language passing this uh, small threshold. We also see uh, cross-language generalization to abstract words. Um, these are the, the translations basically to the directly trained items. And those are also passing that small generalization threshold. Um, but we don't see cross-language transfer to uh, concrete items. When the dominant language is trained, we see some movement for the trained items, but it doesn't reach the small threshold. In fact, nothing reaches the small threshold except cross-language generalization to the concrete items. All right, so now we're gonna switch over to the balanced bilinguals. And what we did for them is we separated them out into English and other. Um, it, for these individuals, uh, other was either Spanish or Tagalog. Um, we did this because the other language was often the more impaired language after the stroke. Um, so first let's look at the results for the other uh, language. And we see that uh, the directly trained abstract items are doing quite well passing that large threshold. Um, we do see a small generalization effect to concrete words in the same language, they're just barely passing that small threshold. Um, and we also see a generalization, a, a cross language generalization to the translations of those abstract words that they were trained on, but no cross language transfer to the concrete uh, items. When English is trained, we see the directly trained abstract words in English just reaching that small threshold. Um, as well as get, we're getting a small effect for uh, within language generalization to concrete words, but we don't see any other significant effects. Keep in mind, this is a small group and not all of the, the people in this group did both phases. So uh, take these results with a grain of salt. But um, in general, we feel like BABSANT is a successful application of ABSANT to bilingual individuals with aphasia. We see both within and cross language transfer. Um, some of the things that we want to do next are we want to uh, test BABSANT uh, with monolingual non-English speaking individuals. Um, and we, we have somebody, a monolingual Spanish speaker lined up and we're very excited about that. Um, we also wanna create a free online version um, of this therapy protocol. Um, I just wanna thank uh, all of the participants that we've had in our studies, all the students who've helped out uh, with these studies. We wanna thank our funding. Um, and then uh, also just uh, this, collaboration between San Francisco State, um, the, the Gray Matter Lab and the Sand Lab has been uh, really fruitful and wonderful. This is, um, and a lot of fun. This is one of our uh, meetings that we had that was on Halloween where we all dressed up for, for the meeting. So, all right, um, any questions? Great, thank you so much, Shalise. That was wonderful. Um, we do have questions. Um, I'd love to start a big discussion about whether guilt can exist outside of the mind. Because I that saw that's a great slide discussion. Again, <laughs> let's maybe let's not. Let's first go to another question by Enriqueta Canseco Gonzalez. How do you handle differences among the various Spanish dialects? For example, the word kite can be papalote or cometa, etc., in the various dialects. Dialects. Yeah, yeah. So we've had a lot of discussions about that um, with for the bilingual naming therapy website. And what what we've done so far is we've just kind of um, gone with what's the most used label um, according to the the Spanish speakers that we've been talking to. Um, but again, that's partly why we have that option to override the response, because if that's not the label you use, then you want to be able to put in a label uh, that you can use. Um, with the generative naming therapy, it's actually been a lot easier to accommodate 
um, for those different labels that people will use because we, we have kind of a conceptual target and, and not really a word target. And, and we, are, uh, we do accept like synonyms as correct responses and things like that. Um, and so, so yeah, it's a lot more flexible with the category generation treatment. Um, we have a question from Danielle Fahey. Uh, what role do cognates and homonyms have in the materials? Yeah, so we actually, so I, uh, we, we know that uh, cognates actually help with cross-language transfer, but we did want to stay away from, from those types of words so that we could reduce the amount of uh, cross-language transfer, transfer that we could attribute to that and really try and get at what sorts of cross-language transfer are we getting just from um, activating uh, the semantic system and those connections between the two languages in the semantic system. And we have another question from Enriqueta Canseco Gonzalez. I imagine that not all patients are capable of doing this training. How do you determine whether a given patient is eligible? That's a great question. So one of the, the tests that we give, so we give a couple of the subtests of the palpa that uh, where the stimuli uh, vary by imageability. And so we have um, both a, a visual and an auditory lexical decision task, um, and then also a visual and auditory synonym judgment task that we do. Um, and kind of the bare minimum is if the person can do the lexical decision task, right? If they're, they're able to recognize words as being actual words, then that's a great step. Um, if, if they're also doing well with the, the semantic or the uh, similarity judgment task, then we'll, we know that they'll probably be a pretty good candidate. Um, we have been trying to um, do this therapy with uh, um, as many different uh, people with as many different types of aphasia as possible, just to kind of see what people's limits are. And, and for people who have a lot of difficulty with production, um, it, it is the treatment effect sizes are low. It's really difficult because a lot of the therapy has to do, it, it, it really requires discussion of the semantic features. Um, and we've also noticed that people who have a lot of comprehension difficulties um, have difficulty with the treatment steps as well. So yeah, this, this does tend to be um, more beneficial to people who are a little bit higher level, but we, you know, this is all kind of anecdotal. We don't have nice systematic results to, to show that, but we're, we're working in that direction. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Another question from uh, Danielle Fahey, which is a little bit related, but um, how is pre-stroke language usage or proficiency determined? And, and maybe I was thinking, maybe you can, in this uh, uh, sense, you can also talk about how you established uh, which, uh, whether the, um, the speaker is balanced or has a dominance for one of the two languages. Yeah, yeah. So we're using the language use questionnaire um, that Swati developed. Um, and, uh, and that has a really nice, it's really thorough and it, it um, has people talking about um, like their confidence in speaking different languages throughout their lifetime, um, you know, how often they use different languages and who they use different languages with and um, uh, how their parents use different languages and their siblings. Um, we also have a language ability rating where we ask them to rate their language ability before their stroke and after their stroke in each language. About your first experiment, um, I'm not sure if you addressed it or if I just missed it. So what do you think can account for the rising baseline that you saw in the words for the caregiver training, whereas you don't see uh, any effects of generalization in the control words? Aren't they similar things? I mean, shouldn't... I Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we're we're actually uh, trying to figure that out right now. We haven't uh, we haven't really figured that out because, like you said, um, if it if it had to do with the spreading activation among the features, um, you'd think that we would see it in the control items. But we haven't done like a really thorough item analysis to make sure that that's the case. Not a difference of in in how like how many times the probes are repeated for the same items or something? No, nothing. Like that. No, because everything, yeah, everything was probed at the same frequency by the same person. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Um, question from Danielle Fahey again. How could similar therapy materials be developed for languages with smaller population, populations or without SLPs, researchers who are native speakers of the language? I think, uh, in principle, how would you go about doing that? Oh, that's interesting. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I, I, we would want, you know, we don't want people, um, I mean, all right, let me back up a little bit. So in order to um, develop materials for this particular therapy, what I would hope is that a speech pathologist who has access to, um, so I, I published the, the therapy protocol and the therapy materials, so all of that's available to any speech pathologist who wants to use it. Um, and I would hope that a speech pathologist who wants to use it with a language that we haven't already um, developed uh, the, the treatment materials for would um, look at how we've developed the treatment materials and try and do a similar process of putting those together. Um, you know, it, at least using their expertise, their clinical and their linguistic expertise um, to develop those materials. But ideally, uh, you know, we'd be able to have kind of consensus from, from native speakers. But I mean, in, in principle, this type of therapy can be used with any category. Um, you know, I, I, I don't see an issue with speech pathologists really tailoring this to their clients and saying, um, you know, the, the category, um, you know, uh, my grandchildren is not like part of <laughs> things that my grandchildren do is an ad hoc category that I don't see listed on your website, but that's what my client wants to work on. Um, and so, you know, that's, uh, I, I don't see a reason why you can't kind of put together ad hoc categories, but just knowing that those categories, you know, haven't been tested um, or normed or anything like that. Thank you. Uh, Enriqueta says, thanks, great talk and great much needed work. Oh, um, thank you. And you're also getting a smiley from Ryan Watson uh, on there. So, that brings us to the end of the comments and questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Sandberg, for your talk. Um, Wonderful. I think Thank we all you. enjoyed it. And uh, I'd like to alert the audience to the talk in two weeks' time, Stadjana Lukic, April 21st. And also, please refer to our website, the CSTAR website. You can find it by Googling CSTAR Aphasia um, for uh, past talks, including uh, the talk by Dr. Becky Jackson uh, from two weeks ago that is online right now. Um, thanks, Shalice, and we hope Thank to see you. all of you again in two weeks' time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.